The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. No, Westford. Westford, Massachusetts. Uh, I guess we can start. Um, let me introduce myself first. So uh, my name is Dimitri Pal. I am with Red Hat. I'm senior manager responsible for identity management portfolio of Red Hat. I have been working with different technologies for the last five years. Uh, I come from RSA, where I spent 10 years in the corporate environment. So open source was uh, a, big of, uh, a, a big change, a big shift, and uh, a, a good learning experience. And um, now I'm responsible of uh, multiple uh, open source projects related to identity management, and we'll talk about them. Uh, so um, how it is interesting that my views about how the software needs to be developed and can be developed and, and how uh, to collaborate in the process of the software development have changed drastically in five years from the moment I start working with Red Hat and uh, very interesting people uh, who work on the projects. So let's start. Um, the today talk is about identity management, enterprise identity management with the open source tools. Uh, so first of all, let's set up a context. So what is identity management? So I assume that people in this room either know about identity management or want to know about identity management. So who knows what identity management is? Can you? Okay. So. Assume you have a good uh, definition in mind, so keep it in mind, and let's see what Wikipedia says about identity management. So identity management describes the management of individual principles. So principles meaning the identities that um, can authenticate and can interact with other identities, so principles the authentication, authorization, and privileges. So who, then the context, where, across system and enterprise, and beyond enterprise boundaries. And what is the reason of all that? The reason is we want to increase security, we want to increase productivity, we want to decrease cost and downtime and repetitive tasks. So there are three pieces who, in what context, and why. So some people think about identity management is more than that, like HR system integrated and, and into the identity management is not an identity management. So there are all sorts of different tools, like Oracle provides a whole stack of managing enterprise users from provisioning, deprovisioning, and so on. So identity management is really about identities within the enterprise and uh, the authentication, authorization, and privileges. So we are not going to talk about Oracle and its stack. We are going to talk about open source tools. However, the biggest elephant in the room is not open source. The biggest elephant in the room is Active Directory. That has been there for many years. It's the uh, golden standard of the enterprise identity management solutions, unfortunately. 90% uh, of the enterprises use, use Active Directory. So um, when we talk about the identity-related technologies in the open source, we definitely need to keep in mind that Active Directory present nearly everywhere in any enterprise that we need to deal with. So keep it in mind, Active Directory will come 
uh, come up multiple times during this presentation. So another um, set of the technologies related to identity management is LDAP. And there are all sorts of different LDAP servers uh, that are open source and not open source uh, that are available. So open LDAP is probably mo mostly popular uh, in the open source community. 389DS uh, is another open source uh, directory server, and Red Hat has a product out of 389 um, based on 389 directory server. It's called Red Hat Directory Server. But there are other um, directory server implementations. Uh, OpenDS or Apache DS, these are open source, and they're closed source like SunDS or eDirectory, e and there is also Oracle in, uh, and, and IBM directories. So uh, there are many of them. I, and I uh, explicitly put dots at the end because there are many implementations, open source, not open source. And uh, I don't want to discriminate between them. But the whole point of mentioning them here is that it's a viable solution for the identity management. So if you want the central management of the accounts, uh, LDAP, any LDAP server comes with the uh, capabilities out of box to manage users, groups, and perform authentication centrally. And any LDAP server provides you with the flex flexibility uh, to customize it, add uh, more data uh, that you want to manage together with the identities that participate in, in your um, enterprise environment. So um, let's move on. Another thing uh, that needs to be mentioned as a technology in this space is Kerberos. So Kerberos uh, is, um, a, has been a project that was started, I think, in the 90s. It was Project Athena at MIT uh, for the um, distributed authentication and um, we, against, the se several, uh, against the central server, but uh, it created a system where once authenticated against an authority, you can then access other resources participating in the infrastructure without re-authentication, providing single sign-on. So that was the first um, system that uh, provided that capability. And then later, other technologies uh, on the web, try to replicate it and uh, reinvent it. But Kerberos provides a very, very good single sign-on capability inside the enterprise resources. And when we talk about enterprise resources, we can be not only talking about uh, web uh, servers, but we can talk about the file servers, the LDAP servers, the databases, and so on. So things that are not exposed to, uh, to the web or don't have, uh, f for, the, for those products and projects, the web component is post thought rather than afterthought, rather than the initial uh, part of the architecture. So uh, there are two implementations of uh, Kerberos that are known in the community that are closed source implementations. So open source implementation is MIT and there is Heimdall implementation. Uh, there are multiple other closed source implementations. Microsoft has uh, implemented Kerberos. Uh, Apple has implemented Kerberos. So uh, Active Directory uses Kerberos for its enterprise single sign-on starting Active Directory 2003. So before that, Microsoft uses so-called NTLM uh, and uh, didn't leverage Kerberos, but once they moved to 2003, they started uh, leveraging Kerberos. And now LT NTLM is pretty much deprecated, and the latest versions of Microsoft clients uh, just don't support NTLM at all. Samba. Samba is a big open source project. It has multiple components, and it is all often con uh, confused uh, what it can do. So Samba consists of several different things. One part is the domain controller. And the goal of the Samba domain controller portion is to be an equivalent of the Active Directory. So the goal is to build a drop-in replacement for Active Directory. 
Uh, another part of the Samba community is focusing on the Samba file server. So it's an equivalent of the Sieves file server and again, drop and replace for the Microsoft uh, file server. And then there is a third component, which is the client component uh, called WinBind that allows you to join a system, and it can be Unix system, Linux system, uh, into the Active Directory and pretend that uh, the system is actually uh, a Windows system. So the server will think that it is talking to a Windows system, but in fact, it would be some other operating system there. Uh, we will talk a little bit about Samba um, in, in the context of that, Samba Windbind in the context of that presentation later on. Our last bullet uh, is NIS. Uh, I am often asked about the best practices. Uh, this presentation is not about best practices, but about NIS. If you use NIS or consider using NIS, don't. So it's the uh, technology from the last century. It doesn't have the security attributes required for the modern deployments. Uh, it just copies, effectively copies password files around. So LDAP or LDAP plus Kerberos or other technologies that we will be talking about in the context of this presentation are much better than NIST. And even if you uh, need, uh, you, you have very old systems that do not support anything other than NIST, consider replacing them with something newer rather than implementing NIST. Uh, we can follow up in the hallway discussion about that. Uh, that's a whole different uh, conversation, but NIST is bad. So um, another thing is uh, web-related technologies. So um, identity management, not only about the enterprise resources like file system and LDAP servers and databases, but also uh, the web resources that are available inside the enterprise and providing uh, identity management within the enterprise, within the web uh, is also important. And uh, there are multiple technologies there uh, that have emerged uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so OpenID, for example, provides you the capability similar to what Kerberos provides. You authenticate against your identity provider and then identity provider is trusted by multiple websites, so you don't need to present your uh, credentials again to those sites. So you don't leak your identity to the sites or, or credentials to the sites that might not be trusted by you. Auth is more about authorization and allowing uh, different web services accessing other web services. So there are also implementations there. SAML is about federation, about uh, allowing the identities that come from a trusted party to be trusted inside your party. So you have two companies that are in trusted relations and you want uh, your, your partner to access your resources. So SAML is a good uh, and well-known technology to, to do that. And there are multiple technologies in the Microsoft world um, that start with WS, and I'm not going to drill down into that, just mentioning it. So for strong authentication, uh, for years, there have been multiple different solutions that boil down to two major categories. One is using certificates on the smart cards, uh, and uh, another is one-time passwords, or OTP. So there are multiple vendors that are in the second bucket that provide all sorts of different solutions, proprietary and based on the uh, open standards like HOTP or TOTP tokens. So uh, the emergence of the, those standards about eight, nine years ago allowed uh, separating really the ecosystem of the OTP vendors into providers of the software and providers of the tokens themselves. Uh, with the smart cards, uh, there are some 
areas like mostly government and some other verticals that prefer the smart card authentication. Microsoft at some point went with the smart card authentication and said, we're not going to embrace one-time passwords, we are going to embrace certificates. So uh, the certificates is the future. So uh, Active Directory supports uh, certificate authentication natively and uh, a lot of uh, different deployments in the government and in financial sector and in oil industry uh, went with the smart cards based solutions for the strong authentication. Okay, so Active Directory versus open source. Why Active Directory is so popular? Well, first of all, it is an integrated solution. It's relatively easy to use. It offers a simple configuration for clients. All the complexity is hidden from users and administrators. Everything happens seamlessly. And all the interfaces are simple, click through. You don't need to know what's happening under, under the hood. Uh, all the magic happens behind the scenes. You just enter a couple things and boom, everything happens. You don't really need to know the guts that a lot of Windows administrators do not realize that they're using Kerberos, for example, as a part of their deployment. It just comes turned on in the latest Active Directory configurations, and you join the systems, and they work. So that's the probably the main reason why Active Directory is popular and con will continue to be popular. So what about open source in comparison to Active Directory? So open source projects historically and traditionally find a problem and solve it well. So it's a small project, small problem, let's do it well, let's fix it, and it works. Great. But what it creates, it creates a bag of the solution. It creates of many, 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 many small uh, pieces that solve specific problems well, but not work with each other. They can, they can be configured, they can be made because they are so flexible and so configurable that anyone can figure out all the permutations of the configurations of every single piece and do it himself. Well, in reality, nobody figures that out, nobody spends that amount of time, it's daunting task to understand all the options and which ones are the right ones, which are ones are the best practices, which ones are not, and so on. So it's a problem. And the user interfaces are not that simple. Uh, definitely open source provides a lot of command line interfaces, but in some cases for the simple tasks, it is just click, enter, and hit OK. And that is missing. So is there the situation really that bad as I'm describing? Well, not exactly. It has been for some time, but there have been attempts to solve that problem and so, so, solve the problems of different technologies not working together. And at that moment, I want to ask you, who have heard about free IPA? Free, free IPA. Identity policy audit. Okay, great. So you can take the stickers, you can take the flyers after. Uh, and we will be talking about free IPA a little bit in the part, as a part of this presentation. Because the problems that I have identified in the previous slide, they are addressed to some extent or fully by the technology that I'm going to pitch here. So IPA stands for Identity Policy Audit, and we so far fo focused on identities and related policies. We haven't touched on the audit side uh, a lot. Uh, definitely logs are provided, but uh, there is no component that would do something that Splunk, for example, does, which I think that we should have at some point, but it is in future. So if you have ideas or resources to do that, welcome. Come and let's build something together. Uh, so the main problems FreeAPA solves 
is central management of authentication and identities for Linux clients. And it is done better than standalone LDAP or standalone Kerberos or standalone NIS or any combination of those. So the whole point of IPA is to provide the best of breed centralized services for the Linux clients. Whatever the Linux client needs, IPA provides. So that's kind of one part. But the second part is that Linux clients do not, and Linux clients meaning uh, Linux servers in your environment, the web servers, the file servers, the database servers, whatever uh, provides the mission critical uh, stuff, the, the mission critical uh, operations for, for your enterprise. But as we said earlier, Active Directory is uh, present in most of the enterprises. So, Free APA not only provides the best uh, services for the Linux clients, but it also acts as a gateway into the Active Directory environment. So it solves two different problems. And uh, we will talk about how it will solve in a couple slides. But first, let's look what is IPA. It consists of several major components. It consists of Kerberos uh, uh, domain controller, KDC, key distribution center. Uh, it's based on MIT Kerberos. It uses LDAP server. LDAP server is based on 389 directory server. DNS server, uh, it's built on bind, and it is an optional component. And um, PKI server, PKI infrastructure. Uh, it's built on top of DocTech. And then in front of that, there is a management infrastructure that provides the command line interface and a uh, nice web UI for the administrators to manage the system and manage identities and policies related to those identities. And then for the self-service users also. Uh, and then Unix Linux systems can be joined and uh, depending upon the capabilities of the client, these or that policies and identity and authentication capabilities out of IPA can be utilized. So it's not only the server side, it's the client side and we'll talk about the client side a little bit. Um, so features. Centralized authentication via Kerberos and LDAP. So you can authenticate as LDAP and you can authenticate as Kerberos. Identity management of multiple different types of the identities. The usual users, the usual groups. We introduce the notion of hosts and host groups in the same way how Active Directory does it. Uh, so we try to steer everybody to stop using net groups for the host aggregation uh, and use uh, host and host groups because it is a cleaner aggregation. Uh, for that, we created a way of automatically creating a net group for every host group you create so that um, you can manage the hosts in nice groups with hierarchies inside uh, IPA and then automatically you have the net group with the same name that you can leverage on the client side for the, for the components that do not understand house groups because definitely the question is how to move to, ho to host and host groups if the client software doesn't understand uh, anything other than net groups for the host aggregation. So that's how it is done. Services, when we talk about services, we, are, we um, talk about uh, Kerberos services. So Kerberos web server, or Kerberos LDAP server, or Kerberos file server. So these are the services that we can manage and provide the keys and identities to them so that uh, when users authenticate it against IPA using Kerberos, they can single sign on into the uh, LDAP server or uh, data server or web server, being that wiki or some other service that is provided inside your enterprise and has the Kerberos single sign-on enabled. So effectively, any kind of service that has 
uh, Kerberos negotiation uh, enabled for it can be managed through IPA, meaning the identity can be given to it and the keys can be given to it. Integrated identities, that's also an important part in comparison to the uh, bare bones LDAP solutions. Bare bones LDAP solutions use the standard schemas and we also provide the standard schemas for the compatibility with the clients. But in addition to that, we tried to impose referential integrity between the identities, which is not a part of the, uh, of the standard schemas. So that allows us to better, uh, to provide better management interfaces and better management capabilities. And when you, um, when you put users into the groups and associate groups or users with the policies, we track the, the relation between the objects, which is not usually the case in the standard scheme. So it's all hidden under the hood. The clients don't, do not need to know anything about our schema extensions. So that's, that's not something that you should worry about from the client perspective. Manageability. Uh, simple installation scripts for client and server. The server can be set up within two, three minutes. It, you can just run a simple command line and uh, provide everything on the command line, or it can be, uh, you can be prompted interactively, and three minutes later, you have a fully functional centralized identity management solution. Uh, it has rich command line interface and web UI. Uh, nearly everything that you can do through the command line is exposed through the web UI. Uh, our policy is that any new feature has to be implemented in CLI first, and then it is exposed in web UI, and we leverage the same server-side code for command line plugins and web UI plugins. It's pluggable. It's plugin-based infrastructure, so it's pluggable and extensible. You can add additional objects and manage those and drop in plugins for additional attributes if you want. So it's a little bit of the development. We would provide the developer guide how to do that, but it can be done. So you can be a part of the interface. You can plug in into the UI. You can plug into the CLI. It's all doable. Um, so that's why sometimes and you can extend schema and you can put your objects. If you define your own subtree, you can use free IPA as a completely like LDAP server because if the data that you want to manage doesn't overlap with the data that we manage, that's fine. You can just use it through the LDAP tools and LDAP modify and so on. But if you want it to be integrated and in some relationship, then you can uh, extend the UI and CLI. Uh, there are three different ways of how you can define the access control model. So you can have self-service rules, what the user can do for his own identity. Uh, you can define roles and permissions and associate uh, the permissions and privileges to the roles and then assign a role to the group of, of the user. So that's more like action-oriented uh, access control. And then you can also define uh, a subset of entities and say that this subset of entities can perform these operations against another subset of entities. So there are three different models that complement each other. Um, certificates of provisioning uh, for host and services. So you can provision, when, when you enroll a client and it is a simple client side script, you just run IPA client install, and it prompts you for, uh, for password, or there are other ways, there are actually three different ways how the client can be enrolled. I'm not going to drill down into the details, but there is uh, manual provisioning or automatic provisioning, so you can do it in multiple different ways. But as a result of that, the, every system receives the certificate, uh, PKI pair, um, and uh, you can, issue additional certificates for the host or specific services running on that host. For example, you have a host on which there are different web applications uh, running and you can issue the certificates for those applic web applications. So for radio server, for example, for uh, TTLS and PEEP, uh, if you want. So 
FreeAPA is capable of serving auto mount maps to different clients. You can define different sets of maps, put them in locations, and location and point different clients to different locations so that you have uh, different views of your maps and, and file uh, file sharing uh, in different locations. So pretty powerful. Um, advanced features, centralized host base access control. So for every client system, you can say these group of users or groups of users can access these group of systems through SSH or through login or through FTP or through whatever, through different login services. And you can uh, define these combinations pretty flexibly and it supports nested groups and all sorts of uh, combinations of those multiple factors. So you can define permissions who can access and it will be enforced on the client side. Centrally managed pseudo, one of the features that have been contributed by our uh, partners outside of uh, Red Hat uh, that uh, implements the centrally managed pseudo. We build together a schema that utilizes groups of objects, groups of uh, commands, and uh, associates them together and then presents it to the client in the standard pseudo schema and uh, you can manage the uh, central privileges and escalation of the privileges uh, through this central server and uh, this data is delivered and cached by the client. So uh, we'll talk about the client a little bit. Group-based password policies. Uh, you can not only define password policies per users or globally default ones, but you can define password policies for groups of users uh, and uh, say how, what is the minimum life? Uh, what is the minimum length, I'm sorry? What is the uh, maximum length? How many groups of different characters can be? What's the history and so on? So multiple policies and you can define that per groups and the most restrictive wins if there are collisions. Automatic management of the private groups. That's one of the security features uh, one of the best practices in the um, file ownership says that if you want the file to be owned by a user, you want the UAD of this, U of this file to be the UAD of the user who needs to own it. And then the group that needs to own this file better have just this single user. That's a good practice, but managing private groups that contain single user is a big overhead if you don't have it automated. So free IPA provides that out of box. They are all hidden. They exist for every single user by default. So when you create a file, uh, it automatically can get the UID and GID of the, of the right groups, of the right user and, and corresponding private group. So it's there for the file to be labeled. Uh, for the legacy systems, all the identities that we have in IPA can be exposed through the NIST protocol if needed. We don't recommend it, but there are some cases where it is the only choice, so it can act as a NIST server for legacy system. Painless password migration, if you are using some LDAP solution and you need to move from LDAP solution to IPA, you need to generate Kerberos keys, and that is a painful procedure. Uh, so to do that, the client is capable of intercepting your authentication and doing the exchange with the server in such a way that the keys are created uh, under the hood without your additional uh, involvement. But you can also go to just the page that we provide and authenticate against that page and it will cause uh, the creation of the, of the um, keys inside the IPA storage. Manage hosts, uh, that's the capability of hosts to manage other hosts. So you have a hypervisor that controls multiple VMs uh, and the, you can run something on the hypervisor that will set up a, a VPN environment for the guests, for example. Or you can have a provisioning system that will enroll other systems. And so that provisioning system uh, will have privileges against the identities of the systems it provisions. So many, delegating the 
access control rights and capabilities to the overlord to provision other systems is what this feature is about. Um, we integrate DNS server. DNS server is optional. Uh, it's built on bind. We recommend using DNS server because uh, DNS is uh, one of the technologies that provides flexible uh, and uh, expansion of the infrastructure. So uh, if, you are, if you are changing your infrastructure, if you are deploying the servers or you are decommissioning the servers, I mean identity servers, uh, because your client uh, set needs to expand, right? So you need to expand your client set dynamically and to serve this dynamic set, you need to expand your servers. So how the clients find the servers? Uh, putting the information about each individual server into each individual client is cumbersome. So using DNS as an intermediary of this information uh, is the best practice. So to uh, provide the service discovery capabilities for the clients, we integrate the DNS into IPA. It's optional if you want to use some other DNS solution inside that is, exists inside the enterprise, you can do that. You can use Active Directory DNS, uh, but we recommend delegating a zone to our DNS, to free IPA DNS, and leverage its capabilities because it also tracks the clients and allows secure update of the AA and AA records inside DNS server by the clients that get the DHCP addresses from the DHCP server. We don't provide DHCP server yet, but this is on the roadmap. Replication. We support multi-master multi replication, so every replica is a master. We support um, up to 20 of those. We also can synchronize uh, users from the Microsoft Active Directory, and we can uh, deploy certificate authorities on different replicas. So you don't need to have the same amount of certificate authorities as the, the number of replicas. You can uh, sort of set less certificate authorities and proxy to them if you want to save on some of the resources because uh, certificate authorities are pretty uh, resource intensive components. Um, and compatibility with a broad set of clients. So a lot of different clients can be used. And at that moment, I want to introduce another component, which is the client component, which is called SSSD, System Security Services Daemon. It has been forked out of Free APA project uh, nearly five years ago, I think in, in, two, in early 2009. Uh, so it provides a set of uh, services that work together to hook the client system into the central identity provider. And central identity provider can be LDAP, can be Active Directory, can be Free IPA, can be just pure LDAP or LDAP with Kerberos. So there are, uh, it, it can use other identity sources, but one of the biggest differences of what it does is it does caching, so you have consistent behavior whether you are online or offline. It does it better than NSCD uh, because uh, it's built into the nature of the data that it fetches and every single piece of data handled in the best way for that data, meaning users, groups, net groups, services, and so on. We handle that, uh, the caching of that information uh, depending upon what kind of use this information has. Uh, because uh, you need, uh, you can allow some latency in some areas and you don't allow latency in other areas. So uh, dealing with those cases is what SSSD does best. It also allows you to connect system to multiple different identity sources at the same time. So you can point into a LDAP server and another LDAP server and Active Directory and IPA and allow users from all those identity sources to log into the system, uh, effectively merging the namespaces together and uh, any, any user out of those sources can log. Uh, it plugs into the PAM and NSS stacks, so it's not an, an invention in its own. Uh, it just brings the 
NSS LDAP and PEM Curve 5 and PEM LDAP to the next level of capabilities. So it effectively already overcame the capabilities of NSS LDAP and most of the capabilities of uh, PEM Curve 5 and everything for PEM LDAP. Uh, for users groups and other things, but not for all the maps. So SSSD is slowly getting into replacing all the variety of the tools in this area, but it is not there yet. So for some corner cases, you still will might need NSS LDAP or an NSCD with it. Or for some cases, uh, for example, if you want smart cards, SSSD doesn't support smart cards yet. We are working on that, it's on the roadmap. But smart card authentication, you would have to use PMPKSS11, for example. Uh, but um, it's all going to happen. And the same with the WinBind, for example. Uh, SSSD now provides understanding of the uh, specific capabilities of the Active Directory and can talk specific protocols. Uh, that WinBind has implemented, but there are still some use cases that SSSD is not capable of. So it is not a one-on-one -on -one replacement for uh, WinBind, but also we are getting there. So for example, if you have a simple setup, SSSD, uh, like Active Directory setup, you have an Active Directory domain and then you can use SSSD to, to deal with, with this domain. But if you have a complex infrastructure of multiple domains, Active Directory domains trusting each other, uh, and you want the uh, Linux system to understand the users coming from the trusted domains, then uh, WinBind is better choice than SSSD, but we are working on that. Uh, so, as I mentioned, multiple parallel sources, all information is cached. And there, is, there are advanced features for free IPA integration. So with free IPA, it knows that free IPA provides centralized host based access control, that it provides uh, SLinux user mapping, that it provides auto mount services, all these things, pseudo. Uh, SSSD can fetch this information and feed this information to the local utilities, to auto mounter, to sudo, to SSH. So there's all that integration built in out of box in the latest version of SSSD. So uh, we, we encourage you to try that because the, the Linux part, the, the, what we claim is that IPA with SSSD do the best job for Linux systems, it's really the fact now, it's not something on the roadmap, it's in existence. Um, next slide is the diagram that is hard to read. That's why uh, we will build it up out of pieces. Yes? Um, as far as the integration part, uh, does it integrate with Red Hat Sabbath server? Hold it, sir. Okay? We'll get to that. So, um, so Free IPA Core consists of uh, Kerberos KDC and directory server. So Kerberos uses the directory server as a storage, but also directory server hooked into the Kerberos so that it can accept uh, GSS API Kerberos based uh, authentication. So they, they glue together and help together uh, each other to provide uh, the identity services. The second piece is the SSSD on the client side. Uh, it uses Kerberos for authentication by default and directory server for users groups, net groups, host groups, uh, host based access control, pseudo, all these things. Just there is no enough real estate on this slide to put all the components that SSSD actually fetches out of the IPA. But uh, we support NSS LDAP or PAM LDAP or PAM Curve 5 again. I'm not showing it because of the real estate problems. But uh, you can point other clients that do not have SSSD to directory server or directory server and Kerberos uh, KDC and use existing components out of those operating systems, Solaris, AX, HP, UX. Uh, or earlier versions of Linux or other distributions that do not have SSSD or have earlier versions of SSSD. You can, all, you can use those components that exist there. You will have limited uh, capabilities, but uh, they, it would work, it would provide the uh, identity lookups and authentication. So can you connect NIS from Rails 3 to this? 
Yes. You can enable the NIS plugin on IPA and point RHEL3 to that server. OK, NTP, Kerberos is time sensitive. So we have, we can figure NTP server on, on, the, on the server side. Um, DNS is optional. So DNS, as I mentioned, provides the name lookups and service discovery for the clients that are enrolled into free IPA. Uh, CA, certificate authority, is also a component uh, on the service side. In the version that we just released in Fedora 19, uh, version 3.2, we actually support uh, CA list installation. So you can bring the certificates from other CA if you have in your enterprise. But uh, the default is we install the CA and it provides all the certificate management capabilities for your hosts and services if you want to leverage it. Um, so management framework uh, is uh, written in Python uh, and it provides the management capability around the entities that are stored in the directory server and certificate management for hosts and services. Um, on the from the management station, you get command line interface and web UI uh, through XML RPC and JSON. We are deprecating XML RPC and moving to JSON purely for that. Uh, next slide, cert manga. The component, this component is very interesting. Uh, it's not installed by default on latest versions of Linux, but you can definitely take advantage of that uh, and install it. It provides the capability of tracking the certificates that have been issued to the system and services on the system uh, and renewing them automatically. So if IPA is your certificate authority, and you don't want to worry about the expiration of your certificates, then you can just t tell CertMonger to track those certificates and they will be renewed automatically. You don't need to write any monitoring scripts or any kind of the rene renewal software. It will be just done behind the scenes. And your certificates, until you revoke them explicitly, will be renewed automatically. And then IPA client component. IPA client, when you enroll the system, what happens is IP client configures SSSD, configures CertMonger if it is available, if you installed it, and configures other pieces if you want them to be configured, like SSH integration, a sudo integration, a Linux integration. These are the things that can be configured uh, automatically when you install IPA client. It's very simple. You can do IPA client, man page on the IPA client. You will see what it, what it provides. Um, the CLI also provides a lot of uh, help and um, you can just type IPA help and then some topic and it will provide you all sorts of information about how to manage different entities in IPA. It also lists the topics that you can query. Um, so free IPA and Active Directory. Users and password synchronization is one option. You can uh, say that IPA will just pull users and synchronize them uh, from Active Directory to IPA. That has been the solution from version one, uh, but it, it works in simple cases, but when you have complex environment and multiple domains, it definitely lacks some uh, capabilities. So what we have been working on for multiple years now, and it is ready, in the uh, Fedora versions uh, and upstream, it's not fully productized in Red Hat versions yet. It's at tech preview, for example, in 6.4, is CrossRAM Kerberos Trust. So the idea is you manage your resources, Windows resources, with Active Directory because Active Directory is best for Windows systems. You manage your Linux uh, infrastructure using IPA because IPA is best for Linux infrastructure. And then you need to have identities to be able to cross the boundary and access the resources on the other side. So how you do it? You can do the synchronization, but it has limitations. So that really the right solution in this case is cross around Kerberos Trust. So we build the capability to trust Active Directory. Active Directory thinks that it is dealing with another Active Directory force. So we talk native Microsoft protocols. We uh, 
present ourselves as another, another forest and, Microsoft, uh, and Active Directory understands that. Uh, there is a huge amount of use cases, really. Cross RAM Curvers Trust is one bullet that you can say, yeah, we support it. But really, if you look at the diagram of how things can interact with each other, there are about 25 use cases, high level use cases and workflow scenarios that you need to, to, to support. So we support some of them right now and there is still work to be done to support um, others. So one of the examples that we don't support yet is transitive domains. So if IPA is in trust relation with Active Directory domain A, and domain A has trust relationships with domain B, we don't know anything about domain B yet. So, uh, but that's on the roadmap, we're working on that. Free IPA and web technologies. We have, uh, we have been looking into the, this area for quite a while. We want it to happen. We haven't done a lot. This is a green field. If anyone wants to come in and contribute and work in this area, it's definitely something for grabs. Uh, one of the first things that free API can, can be used as, as an open AD provider. So if you have websites inside your enterprise that understand open AD, turning IPA as an identity provider, open ID identity provider would be a good solution to have. Another solution is when you ha consume external services, for example, you use salesforce.com or you use some other service from the external entity and it uses uh, SAML um, assertions for the federation, what you can do is you can use uh, JBoss, for example, or maybe some other solution uh, and turn your internal Kerberos authentication into the external SAML assertion. So we have all these pieces together, we have all these pieces sort of yet in the bag. We understand that we have all the technologies to make that happen, but we haven't looked in actually configuring them together and gluing them together. So that's another area that of interest for us and any, any contributions and research in this area will be much appreciated. Free API and strong authentication. OTP support was just added uh, into Free APA. We had a test day on Thursday and Friday in Fedora. Uh, so it provides, uh, it's the first solution that leverages the capability of uh, Kerberos to proxy uh, authentication to the external sources. It is the spec that put, has been put together by RSA. They just put a spec and say, okay, someday someone will come and implement Kerberos with the OTP support. Guess what? We came in and implemented it. And that's a first existing implementation of the Kerberos and OTP protocol glued together. So what does it give you? It gives you the ability to authenticate with the two-factor authentication at the client side and get a ticket and single sign-on inside the resources. So uh, you have, you proved that who you are with OTP and then you securely access multiple resources without typing and retyping. So every, every time you pull your OTP token, there is a probability that something goes wrong. It's just the statistical probability. So less authentications with uh, your OTP means a less cost to the help desk. So there are two features. Proxy to external radio server, we can, uh, so KDC just turns around and f uh, proxies forwards the request to the configured radio server. And uh, you can load the TOTP tokens. We don't provide yet any CLI or UI, you can do it through the uh, LDAP modify and LDAP commands, but the core, the framework works. So free API future, more cross product integration. It is not integrated with the satellite yet. So it's on the roadmap. It will happen this calendar year. And uh, there, are, there, are, there is a big set of features that we want 
uh, to integrate with satellite, we want to integrate with OpenStack, OpenShift, all sorts of different projects. Uh, JBoss also, so we are working with multiple teams. We are working with multiple teams that uh, on integration of the identities. And right now, I think uh, next week, I'm giving a presentation at the summit, and I will be talking about the integration with the OpenShift and JBoss. It's on f next fr upcoming Friday. Uh, another thing that we want to do is support more sophisticated Active Directory integration use cases. We are working on that. Uh, we are working on polishing OTP solution, as I mentioned. We can't manage the OTP tokens yet. Uh, there is no CL command line or web UI interface, so we need to add that. Uh, we want to bring in the functionality from PEMCURB 5 and PEMPKCS 11 into SSSD, so we want SSSD to be able to support smart cards and SSSD to be able to uh, replace WinBind in all the use cases. Uh, on the other hand, we want the IPA server to be able to support uh, the user certificate authentications using P uh, PKinit. So these are the things that also on the roadmap we're working on that. Uh, for the core IPA itself, we want to add DHCP integration, and we have a huge backlog of RFEs. People come in and say, well, how about this? How about that? And uh, we are welcome any external contributions, uh, and the free IPA and SSSD communities are open, friendly, responsive, and welcoming. So any ideas, any, anyone who wants to run with us, please come and run with us. We are very nice and gentle. So, and with that, uh, these are the resources, these are the pointers to the mailing list, to the wikis, to the track instances, everything is public. We do, our, our track instance is the common denominator and please come and, and work with us. And with that, questions, I think we have a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, so how well do you work with Google Authenticator? Because I'm, I'm excited, by the way, props to the So uh, with Google Authenticator, it was demonstrated that you can point through the radius to, the, to Google, and you can have a Google Authenticator. But we also use TOTP. So our TOTP tokens, if you, you can, uh, there is a QR, QR code generator. And, and you, yes, and it works with Google Authenticator, yes. Is it in the, is it in the package right now? Yeah, you, you, can, you can give it a try, yes. So if you go to Fedora, Fedora test days, and there is a free IPA to factor authentication test day page, and you will see all the workflows and test cases, and you can execute, and it will leverage Google Authenticator. Yes? Can I install the native um, free IPA client on Solaris? There is no free IPA client for Solaris. No, uh, not Solaris, Slaz. Slaz. SUSE. SUSE. Okay, the question is about uh, SUSE client. So I think there is a port of SSSD to SUSE. SSSD actually in SUSE, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, I, I noticed it's in FreeBSD, different versions. Uh, for the client itself, IP client, I don't know whether it is ported to, to SUSE. Uh, you need to ask on the mailing list. So, yeah, we welcome any, any ports. But if, if there, it is not ported, that means that you would need to provide some scripts to configure SSSD and Surfmanga if, if you want to, to do pretty much what the client does. Because client is actually a configuration script. It runs once and that's it. There is no daemon there. Uh, how about OS X? OS X. Mac. Mac. No. <laughs> so Mac has its own capabilities, and if you can use native tools uh, to do LDAP and Kerberos, it would work. But there is no client for Mac, right? There is no SSSD for Mac. It, it's not a problem setting up um, free API. IPA, yeah. IPA. Um, and I have an active Red Hat support contract. Can I call Red Hat? 
Yes, you can call Red Hat. Yes, absolutely. It's, yeah, for a Red Hat part, it's a part of the, any uh, Red Hat subscription without additional fee. So you don't, need, you don't need to do anything, no extra charges. It's just included. Uh, what do you mean other upstream version? So CentOS, CentOS, Scientific Linux, they both have IPA and IPA client and SSSD. They just clone everything that is in there. We are also working with the upstream communities, uh, Debian, Ubuntu, uh, there is a maintainer, his name is Tima Altonen. He is porting He's maintaining the client piece uh, in Ubuntu and Debian, and he's working slowly on the port of IPA to Debian and Ubuntu. So, uh, but we welcome any other contributions to, to work with other distributions. It's, we just focus on, on Fedora, but if you want to come in and port it to, I don't know, FreeBSD, be my guest. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I will be in the hall. If you have any questions, we can follow up. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base um, 
everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary, everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloud Stack Management Server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, 
uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.